Greetings, friends, and welcome back to Worship with the Longmeadow Congregational Church, United Church of Christ in Auburn, New Hampshire. If you are worshiping with us for the first time, my name is Reverend Ruth Gallat. I'm the pastor of the Longmeadow Church. I come to YouTube twice each week. I'm here every Wednesday, every Sunday, rather, with a worship service for the entire church family, and I'm also here every Wednesday with a special message for the children of our church, and I am so glad that you are here worshiping with us. We are now in the season of Eastertide, a time when we spend a lot of time listening to Jesus in this post-resurrection time when he has come back and he is giving those last instructions so that his disciples can go on without him here on earth. And it is a time of joyful messages, but complicated ones, as Jesus comes to the disciples and us in ways we never expected. And so we are so glad that you are here with us. We had a wonderful Easter and on what is commonly the lowest attended Sunday of the year, we had a larger than average attendance at our worship service last Sunday. And for that, we give thanks. And we are so glad that you are here with us as well. We are so glad for the opportunities to reach beyond our own walls, beyond the people to whom we are usually speaking, that we may reach out and share the love that we have found in God. And so we are glad that you are here today. I do need to apologize for my odd lighting. Um, the season is changing, uh, the lighting is changing, but as this is the time when I am able to do this recording, I hoping that you can bear with me as the sun is beginning to go down and uh, shining light a little oddly, but um, I hope that you will bear with me in that uh, and not worry too much about that. We begin our services with prayer each week, and then we share scripture and then a brief reflection on that scripture. And so we are glad that you are here worshiping with us and that you are able to be with us. If you are feeling blessed by this time of worship and would like to support the ongoing ministries of the Longmeadow Congregational Church, I have provided an address in the description down below where you can send any, in any offerings of support. And we are grateful no matter how much it is. And so, my friends, let us now begin our worship with prayer. Each week, we raise up our siblings in Christ in churches throughout New Hampshire, um, naming six or seven of those churches and asking God's blessing on them. We also ask for a blessing each week on a different ministry of our own church. And this week, I invite you to join with me in praying for the ministry of our breakfast crew, what we call our breakfast crew. Our church has a, a ministry uh, of serving breakfast once a month to our community. It is a fundraising effort, but we turn no one away. It is an all-you-can-eat breakfast. It's always on the second Saturday of the month. And we would love to have you come and join us if you are in the area. But it is just something we, we as I said, we do, we do make money off of it, but it has become so much more than a fundraiser. Our beloved breakfast continues to grow by leaps and bounds since beginning anew last year. With just last month, we welcomed in over 180 people to share a delicious meal together with family and their Auburn neighbors. And so this month, we raise up to God our thanks for the opportunity to once again serve and for the many people who work together to make this possible. All the shoppers and uh, bacon cookers, setup crew, muffin bakers, cooks, servers, table bussers, and cleanup crew who all work together as a team, not that are far too, men too numerous to mention individually, to make this ministry to our community a powerful witness of hospitality and God's extravagant welcome. 
Please pray for all the crew and consider becoming part of this ministry. If you are in our area, we always welcome people onto the crew. Also, uh, speaking of light, uh, this has been a really unusual week of, of, of weather and uh, celestial astronomical events. We had an enormous snowstorm um, on last Wednesday into, uh, uh, into Thursday where most of the state lost power. Um, I, I was out of power 14 or 15 hours, but I know that there were people here in Auburn who were well more than 24 hours without power. Um, and I am recording this on Monday and most of the snow is gone <laughs> and there's just a little bit left. Um, but today is another extraordinary event. Um, we are experiencing a lot of excitement here in New Hampshire because of the total eclipse of the sun. Uh, we are, well, the northern part of the state in particular is in what is called the path of totality. And so that if the further north you get in the state, as you get closer to the Canadian border, you, you will see a complete e eclipse of the sun where the moon is right in front of, completely obscuring the sun. Here in our area in southern New Hampshire, um, it wasn't absolutely total, but it was a day of incredible celebrating to see something that was really once in a lifetime. They, they were um, eclipse glasses handed out all over the place. The library had a huge event. The children were able to to view it and it was a, a, a time of real excitement um, to be able to experience something that is is far from an everyday uh, experience and to be able to join together in it. And so I just celebrate that, um, all of the celebrations around the eclipse. And so now my friends, I invite you to join with me in prayer. Resurrected and living God, you have so much to show us and to tell us, things that no human eyes have seen, things that no human ears have heard, things that you have prepared for those you love. Mighty God, your promises are like shelter in a storm to us and to our children and to all those far and near, to everyone who hears your call. Even when we doubt and our joy is mixed with fear, you continue to come to us offering peace and revealing your love for us through Jesus Christ. And so we come to you first with our gratitude for the joys and the blessings of our lives. On this day, Lord, we give you thanks for the ministry of our breakfast. We give thanks for those we serve, those who reach out and invite others in, those who gather around tables with friends old and new. We give thanks for all those who work so hard to make it happen, whether they be shopping or bacon cooking, setting up or cleaning up, cooking, baking, or serving. We all work together to make this a place where people may find welcome and we pray may also find you here, O oh God. Thank you for the success of our endeavors and for the love that makes it possible. We also give you thanks for our siblings in Christ in churches throughout New Hampshire. And this week we ask a special blessing on the Congregational Church of Errol, the First Baptist Church of Etna, First Baptist Church Exeter, Christ Episcopal Church Exeter, First Unitarian Universalist Society of Exeter, the Congregational Church in Exeter, UCC, and the Exeter United Methodist Church. We give you thanks for the ministry of all these churches and ask that you bless them, that they may continue to reach out and welcome others in, to be a blessing to you and to all whom they meet, that your word, your light, and your love may be shared as widely as possible. And Lord, we give you thanks on this week for all of the amazing manifestations of your creation, for both the flowers that are blooming as well as the snow that fell, for the life that goes on, and for the amazing totality.
totality of your cosmos. And this week we were able to gather in groups and to watch the extraordinary event of a total eclipse. We give you thanks for those who made these gatherings possible, but mostly we give you thanks that you allow us to see the unfolding of your creation and the beauty that it brings. You have revealed to us your presence and demonstrated your love, but we still let our doubts and fears enter our lives. We want to believe, we need to believe, for it is too easy for the empty promises of the world to dazzle our eyes. And so we come to you, Lord, with all of our fears and doubts, our joys and sorrows, our longings and dreamings. We bring these things to you in hope that you will hear our prayers and respond to our cries. We bring to you the names of those people whom we love, for whom issues of loneliness, pain, suffering, and grief and loss seem to abound. We pray for all those who are ill, awaiting test results or receiving treatment. We pray for all those who have died and those who are grieving. Lord, we know that just like the disciples in that room behind the locked door, behind every door we pass every day, there are people who feel broken, feel frightened, feel lost. There are people struggling with challenges in their lives of which we have no knowledge. And so this day, we ask that you help us to let go of our need to know and without question to raise up to you the sorrows of the world unknown to us, but known to you and cared for so deeply. Help us to lead with our wounds so that others may know that we are approachable, just as you made yourself approachable by your wounds. This week, so many things have happened in our lives. Some of these things have been wonderful and caused our heart to rejoice. Other things have torn at our spirit, seeking to bring us down. And so we pray that you will lift us up, Lord. Open our eyes to you. Help us to see your presence in all your world, including in our very lives, as we lift our hearts to you now in silence. Hear us, heal us, bless us, O Lord. For we ask these things in the name of the one who was raised that we might have eternal life, Jesus Christ our Savior, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, the sun is continuing to move, so I'm going to just shift a little bit here and continue with our scripture reading this morning, which comes to us today from the Gospel of Luke. Chapter 24, verses 36 to 49. That's Luke 24, 36 to 49. While they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. And he said to them, Why are you frightened? Why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. Yet for all their joy, they still were, disp they were still disbelieving and wondering. And he said to them, have you, anything to have you anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. And then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead, and on the third day, from the dead on the third day, and that Repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and see, I am sending upon you what my Father has promised. 
So stay here in the city while you have been, until you have been clothed with power from on high. This, my friends, is the word of God. In our, I'm going to take off my glasses because the sun is going to just shine on them. So bear with me. In our Bible study classes, we have spoken about the fact that the book we have today as the Bible is the result of many discussions and many compromises. As the story of this man, Jesus of Nazareth, spread from place to place, it was first done so by word of mouth. One person telling the story that he or she had heard, and then people hearing and pondering these things in their hearts, and then sharing them with others. Those people heard and pondered and shared over and over so that the good news was spread. Eventually, these stories were written down, but as is common with such things, the written versions varied, sometimes slightly, sometimes widely, depending on, well, many factors. And so, after a few centuries, leaders of the different churches came together to sift through all of these documents and come to a consensus about which were to be kept and which were to be discarded, with the intent of keeping the story both consistent and true. In that process, some interpretations from the ponderings were discarded as heresies. A heresy is a belief that is inconsistent with or explicitly undermines the story of the gospel. Slight variations were allowed, and as such, we do have four distinct different gospels, each slightly different, highlighting different aspects of the story, but none that explicitly contradicts the others. By sheer chance, we do still have ancient copies of these dis discarded documents, and we often hear sensationalized stories about their discovery. Headlines in news magazines about the discovery of the hidden gospel of Thomas or Mary or <gasps> Judas. But the fact is, we've known about these, and scholars have studied them for years, centuries, actually. And there is one set of discarded scriptures that I wanted to speak about today that are called the Gnostic Gospels. That's G-N-O-S-T-I-C, Gnostic Gospels. Now, I'm not going to go into depth. That would take a very long time. But the basic premise of the Gnostic beliefs is that Jesus was fully divine, period. He only appeared to be human because God would never stoop so low as to take on the base, defiled, dirty, corrupt form of a human that was, that was just more than they could believe. Well, this entire line of thinking clearly contradicted everything that the scripture had taught. And the gathering of church leaders threw it out as heresy. For without God taking on our form, there was no sacrifice at the cross. There was no resurrection. There was no promised salvation for humans. Without Jesus being fully human and at the same time fully divine, none of the story made any sense. Before the coming of Jesus, the people had been awaiting a Messiah for a long time. For millennia. But they did not know the form he would take. Many believed and wanted him to be a warrior or king messiah, someone like King David, but, but even greater. Someone who would come and destroy their enemies, put them on the top, and usher in a line, a time of glory for the chosen ones. And yes, that sounded pretty good from their vantage point, under the dominion and oppression of one conqueror after another, Assyria, then Babylon, and now Rome. But that wasn't the Messiah they got, was it? They got Jesus, a man who came to heal and comfort, to feed and teach, who in each of his appearances after the resurrection did not come brandishing a sword, but with the gentle words, peace be with you. They got, what they got was someone who suffered, someone who died, not just looked like he died, but actually died. 
someone who showed all the vulnerabilities and weakness of a human, including death. And in today's reading, he comes to them not simply bearing, but using the marks that suffering and of that suffering and death to prove to them that it is truly him. Last week, like last week's encounter with Thomas in John's Gospel, Jesus shares his wounds with them, and in that sharing, their relationship is strengthened and made more real than it ever was before. Jesus chooses to not only retain his brokenness, but to reveal it to them, because this is the way they will truly know him. In her 1994 book, The Disabled God, Toward a Liberatory Theology of Disability, Nancy Island warns us not to take lightly the fact that Jesus came back to life with his body visibly broken. She says, in presenting his impaired body to his startled friends, the resurrected Jesus is revealed as the disabled God. His wounds and their scars remain an essential part of his resurrected identity. My friends, they're not a divine punishment or an opportunity for further healing. They are simply there. They are part of who he is, broken and willing to share the brokenness. Debbie Thomas wrote, What would it be like for us to follow in the footsteps of a disabled God? What would it be like to lead with our scars instead of enslaving ourselves to society's expectations of piety and prettiness? Jesus proved that he was alive and approachable by risking real engagement, real presence, as in, here is how you can recognize me by my hands, by my feet. See, I have scars, I have baggage, I have history. I am alive to pain just as you are. I am not immune. I am real. I don't know about you, friends, but I'm not like those who were waiting for the warrior Messiah to come down and destroy my enemies. I'm not like the Gnostics who couldn't tolerate the thought of a God who would choose to be human. I want, I need God who is willing to come to me, a God who understands my weakness, my suffering, my fears, my failures, my pain, my wounds, and to love me, love me not in spite of them, but because he knows what all that feels like. He understands, he shares, and he loves in the face of them. There was a great German theologian, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who died a martyr when he was executed by the Nazis for sharing the gospel instead of their propaganda. Shortly before his death, Bonhoeffer wrote, only a suffering God can help. In the face of our weakness, our suffering, our fears, our failures, our pain, our wounds, only a suffering God can help. Only one who was himself wounded and was willing to be known by his wounds can truly save, my friends. Even here in the victory of the resurrection, Jesus came to them wounded and hungry. Have you anything to eat, he asks. They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and he ate it in their presence. Because he came to them in this way, they could move beyond their fear and come closer to him. Something a sword brandishing warrior or one unwilling to defile themselves with our humanity could ever accomplish. As Bonhoeffer said, only a suffering God can help. Because they were no longer afraid, because they were able to approach, now the disciples could both hear and follow his call upon them. You are witnesses of these things. They could now go out and tell what they had seen. They could share their experience of and relationship with Jesus, the one who was wounded and shared his wounds, the one who was hungry and ate with them, simply by expressing hunger, inviting hospitality, and accepting nourishment, Jesus turns a simple simple bit of fish into communion. 
This is why we share a meal together each month. This is why I raised up our community breakfast this week, not simply as a fundraiser, but as a ministry, both deserving of and in need of our prayers. Because offering hospitality, serving each other, and eating together breaks down all barriers and true nourishment happens. When we treat each guest as if they were Jesus who asked, have you anything here to eat? We make this into a place where no one needs to hide their hunger or their wounds. We make this truly a house of God. Thanks be to God. My friends, I thank you for joining me here this day. I thank you for tolerating the shifting light, but it is all part of God's beautiful creation. And so I am glad for the light. I rejoice in both its coming and its going. I rejoice in both the snow and the flowers. And I rejoice especially in our gathering together, whether it is in person, on Zoom, or here on YouTube. For each time we gather and connect, God is there among us. And I say thanks. I hope that you will join us again next week. And until then, my friends, go in peace and return in joy. Thank you for joining me here. Goodbye.